Um, Liz Truss has resigned as the Prime Minister after 45 days in office. I wondered if she was the shortest serving Prime Minister in UK history, but I've now had that confirmed. And nominations are now open for those who will replace her. She actually got elected, and it's very interesting, by the Conservative Party, by the membership of the Conservative Party. There is quite a question as to whether or not she would have been elected if it had been left to the MPs to choose, as would have been the case in New Zealand, um, in terms of selecting party leaders. But we will talk about this and more with Professor Robert Patman from Otago University, a political scientist and a bit of a specialist in international affairs. Um, welcome to the show, Professor. Good morning to you. Oh, good morning, Michael. Um, yes, it's, it's right, isn't it? Would she have got the job in the first place if it had been left to the Tory caucus? I think about a third of the MPs favoured her, but there was a very influential group that were firmly behind this trust, and that was the European Research Group, which are the... Uh, about, I think it's about over 100 Conservative MPs belong to this group, which is um, pro-Brexit, uh, fervently Brexit. And they saw Liz Truss as someone who could deliver the sort of budget that, the, you know, the Brexit Brexiteers had always um, imagined they would be able to go move towards. The budget, of course, was high growth and low tax. And um, the, she was basically, they got firmly behind Liz Truss and uh, she 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 got the vote from the Conservative Party membership. That's really what put her over the top, as your comments rightly say. Uh, I think the majority of the MPs, Conservative MPs, favoured Rishi Sunak, who had much more uh, high-level financial experience uh, under Boris Johnson. And, yeah, I mean, it, in a sense, um, Liz Truss was always up against it from the beginning, not just in terms of her political background. She hadn't had what I call sustained high-level financial leadership experience, but also, uh, I, I think, um, whoever's leader of uh, the Conservative Party, indeed, leader of the country at the moment, has to deal with the elephant in the room, which is the disastrous impact of Brexit. Um, the interesting thing, though, was I remember her election, uh, Professor Patman, being paraded as sort of the triumph over stale old white men because... Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. It, not, she, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, the Home Secretary and the Foreign Secretary, there wasn't uh, a white male amongst them. Um, now, the Chancellor of the Exchequer's gone, she's gone, uh, the Home Secretary's gone, <laughs> the Foreign yeah, Secretary's gone, they've all gone, haven't they? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the government disintegrated, basically, but the, the turning point, of course, was when the budget, the mini budget was introduced. Uh, Britain's got one of the highest ratios of debt in relation to GDP in, in the world. It's about over 100% now, or around about 100%. Wow. And, of course, what they went forward with was... I, and remember, they had weeks to prepare for this. In fact, I watched Liz Truss having a leadership debate uh, with uh, Rishi Sunak. This went out... Michael, this was conducted for about six weeks over the British summer. So... No one could say that Liz Truss didn't have a chance to reflect on what might happen if she became Prime Minister. And he basically challenged her. He said, look, your, your financial plan of um, tax cuts, huge tax cuts, and our high growth strategy won't work. The markets won't buy it. And, of course, he was absolutely right. Um, when Liz Truss and her um, Chancellor introduced the Chancellor of the Exchequer introduced their long cray, you know, the, the, the plan that they'd always wanted. Uh, it, it basically was dead on arrival. Uh, they would not, the markets and the international community would not accept a heavily indebted country borrowing more, 45 billion to fund tax cuts for the better off. So that it, the government has never really recovered from the fact that their plan their mini budget was widely rejected and in her desperation uh, Liz Truss had to t not only get rid of her chancellor who, who she described as being a soulmate with but she also had to turn to someone who she basically opposes within the Conservative Party which was Jeremy Hunt uh, who's seen as a Remainer uh, someone who didn't want Brexit and who's seen as um, 
uh, being on the opposite wing of the party. So uh, that, that didn't steady the ship. One of the first things Hunt did when he took over was to rubbish the Prime Minister's strategy. And he would have only have done that if he knew that she was in deep trouble. So, yeah, it's a, it, it, in, in many respects, it, it's a very difficult situation in the UK. And there's no guarantee, Michael, whoever comes in will immediately stabilise the problem. At the moment in British politics, there's a reluctance to face up to the fact that Britain's departure from the EU has not gone according to plan. Even the leader of the opposition can't really mention Brexit. It is such a divisive issue in British politics. Mm, I, I notice also, though, um, that um, no one is talking about going back into Europe. So, well, I mean, people probably are, but it's not a polit- on the political agenda of any party. So they're going to have to cope with what Not yet, not yet, no. No, well, they're going to have to cope with what they've got. Um, yep, sure. So the question then becomes uh, bizarre and short, though the reign of Liz Truss may have been. Who right. are the favourites to replace her? Good question. Um, Boris Johnson wants to have another crack. Uh, I don't think he's going to be acceptable, though, to most MPs. And what's interesting about what's happened, uh, Michael, is that those pushing for high tax, um, uh, sorry, uh, tax cuts and high growth have been rebuffed, which is probably the sort of, you know, right of centre members of the Conservative Party. Um, so I think uh, there's no... Uh, Boris Johnson was identified with that wing. Uh, but I, I think he's going to have a difficulty of making a quick comeback because he's been too ego- economical with the truth on a, on a consistent basis for many Tories. And mo- most Tory MPs now, they're not clinging to ideology. They're looking at survival. Mm. And, you know, in, the, in, the two, in, a, in a two-party system, it's not like the electoral system in Britain is different, of course, from that of New Zealand. In a two-party, first-past-the-post system, if one of the two parties slumps to third place in the polls, they can get obliterated, they can get eliminated. And at the moment, um, the Tories are about 19% in the polls. So there's many nervous uh, Conservative MPs, and they'll be going for someone they believe can save their uh, political career. But when's the and, next? When's uh, the next election? Uh, when does it have to be by? Well, technically, it's got to be. There has to be an election, I believe, by twenty twenty four, late twenty twenty four. Right. So you've got two you years. The contenders. Yeah. I mean, Boris Johnson's won. We just have to see how that works out. I'm not convinced he'll be acceptable. But there's, I think, there's three serious contenders. Um, there's Jeremy Hunt, who who's come in, and, and, and for many members of the party, said all the right things since he's been um, Chancellor of the Exchequer and managing the economy, but he had not had a lot of time, of course. Uh, sec- there's a couple... Uh, Rishi Sunak, who finished second uh, to Liz Truss, believes he is the logical successor. Um, so he's another contender. And uh, a third one, who's reluctant, but very able, is Ben Wallace. Ben Wallace is the Defence Secretary, mm. who's played a key role in uh, UK support for Ukraine's uh, resistance to the Russian invasion. Um, Wallace was asked to put his hat into the ring last time round when Liz Truss and Sunak were competing for Johnson's position. Uh, he declined to do so, saying he likes being Defence Secretary and he had no ambitions to become Prime Minister. Apparently saying the same thing this time round. But uh, it's often the case in politics, as in life, that people who are disinterested in the top job can often be very capable of doing it and do a good job. So it'll be interesting to see what happens, whether Ben Wallace, the Defence uh, Minister, will become under a lot of pressure to put his hat into the ring. We'll just have to see. Um, the other... I mean, I, looking from the outside, and I'd love Boris Johnson to do it again just because it would be just so entertaining. Um, <laughs> and he does... Yeah, but it can... <laughs> I should say, it's entertainment at a cost, Michael. <laughs> oh, well, you see, the, the, it's, it's funny you should say that, because if I look at Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak uh, in particular, I can't yeah. see somebody who could construct a winning election out of those two. Yeah, but you see, uh, winning election is basically making sure bread and butter issues are dealt with. You can have all the razzmatazz, but... Britain's economy has slumped from being the fifth largest in the world to the seventh. Yeah, I guess that's and right. Over two, yeah. 
and two trillion yeah. pounds worth, not dollars, two, two, two trillion pounds worth of investment has lost, has left the UK since it joined the EU, uh, since it left the EU. Mm. So this is a huge, uh, Britain is in free fall economically at the moment, and it's been like that way for some time. Someone has to actually, you know, stop the rot economically. And um, as I say, I, I think many people found Johnson entertaining at one level, but on another level, as they saw their standard of living savaged, they found it less and less funny. And so probably what Britain needs at the moment is not an entertainer, but someone's substance. Yeah, I understand that argument, but I'm just thinking to myself also, if uh, Kesuk Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, the leader of the opposition, got his, or what he argues is his, his wish, which is to have a snap election, which would normally seem appropriate in circumstances like this, but I'm right. not sure that he'd have the solution tomorrow either, would he? Given the enormous no, pressures... I, I... No, I, 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 I actually agree with you. I think the problem with Keir Starmer uh, and his leadership is that he hopes to get there by default. He's not actually tackling the issues which is causing the problem. Mm. He hasn't made a commitment to reverse Brexit. Mm. And that's the heart of the British problem at the moment. And he's not talking about electoral reform. Um, Britain's got an unfair electoral system and they need to do something about it. I mean, at the moment... Um, people keep talking about the landslide that Boris Johnson won in uh, 2019. But what we have to remember is he only won 43% of the vote. In this country, he wouldn't be able to form a government without a coalition partner. And more people voted against Johnson than for him. So there's, if you're going to try to heal and, and build unity within society, you do need governments which, in electoral terms, reflect a substantial majority of the people. And at the moment, that's not the case. I, as I say, I think Starmer would be a competent leader. And he's, in his words, he's going to try and make Brexit work better than the Tories. But I, I, I'm not sure, unless he starts really dealing with some inconvenient truths about British politics, whether he's going to positively transform a, 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 and push Britain in a more positive direction. Um, I disagree with you about Brexit, but that's OK. We'll just agree to disagree on that one. But looking forward, um, I can't see Britain going back into Brexit. I just don't... It's just not a... It's just not a goer. Uh, can I just explain what I meant by Brexit being a problem? I think it's very important for our listeners to understand what's happened because of the, it is an emotive issue, and I, I, I fully understand and respect that. But what Britain has tried to do... It has left the most prosperous single market in the world of more than 550 million and shrunk its tariff-free market down to 65 million. Now, this, you could just imagine, it's the equivalent of New Zealand saying, OK, what's our big three... Yeah, but I, I don't want, yeah, but I don't, want to, I don't want to talk about the merits or demerits of Brexit here. I'm just saying that no, sure. politically, I do not believe that Keir Starmer could win an election. God, you'd probably find the social... No, they, they want to go back in as well. It'd be difficult. He, he deliberately avoids it because he knows it divides his own constituency. Oh, yeah. It? Yeah, and, it, and, and, and <coughs> at one level, it's a smart thing, and you're right. You know, avoiding the conversation is good. But I, I was just reflecting on your question, how would he actually do it in power? I mean, quite frankly, he's got a very good prospect of getting into power. No, you see him. I mean, uh, well, he'll walk him, actually. And, and he's election. a smart guy. He's yeah. a smart guy. And um, because we all know that disunity is, at the end of the day, um, fatal for any party uh, in any Western government. It is. It is. But sometimes in politics, you have to be courageous. You can't always mm. put your finger up to the wind and see which way the wind's blowing. You actually have to lead. Yeah, and no, sometimes I, there, are politics, of, there are a lot of dead politicians that believe that, Robert, can I tell you? Um, yeah, but there's also a lot of dead ones who go with the wind as well. Uh, yeah, but I have to say that uh, politicians that tend to believe that the public aren't as important as their particular ideology. Oh, no, I wasn't, I wasn't suggesting that for one moment. I yeah. wasn't saying that, you know, politicians should be top down. I'm just saying I think you have to strike a balance between obviously being responsive to the public mood, but being prepared when you've got the information at your disposal to give leadership on a key issue, even if it ruffles a few feathers. But that's just, you know... No, fair enough. My now, moving on. Yep. The other reason I've got you on the sure. show is because I've read something uh, that you've written or said in the last 24 hours about New Zealand needing to have a more independent foreign policy. 
um, and, and you're suggesting that we are not performing as we should be on the international stage. I'm interested in developing, we, what do you mean by that? Uh, I, I, what, what I, was, I was referring, I was responding to an interview I did um, and I was asked about New Zealand's position with regard to Iran and um, where, as you know, there's turmoil in Iran at the moment with uh, women, young women, leading a protest against the theocratic government there. They're being very courageous and there's been many deaths. And I just felt that given the values of this country, and this is a bipartisan point, I think as many national supporters as Labour supporters would feel the same and other parties in between, that we would expect to speak out probably more publicly in support of those who are only asking for the same rights that we already enjoy. Why do you um, think the Prime Minister hasn't done that? I don't know. I think um, it may be. I, I would have thought, in theory, she would have been quite vocal on that issue. I would have thought so um, too. But it may. Um, but on, on the other hand, it, she may have thought it was not helpful and counterproductive, and she didn't want to do anything that would make the, the regime there more repressive. Uh, I, I personally take the view with authoritarian regimes, you can't tiptoe around them. I agree. And um, the, mm. uh, so the, uh, the other point. You, just mention here, Michael, with respect to your question, it may be that we are trying to, as a country, build up good relations with the Gulf states. Um, we've got growing economic ties there. And it's no secret, most of the Middle Eastern countries are actually, although they don't like Iran, they don't like the regime there, they actually side with Iran on this issue of women's rights. So uh, I'm wondering if we're keeping quiet so that we don't offend other partners that New Zealand has. That, that would seem Middle extraordinary East. to me, Robert, because here we are going through probably a woke revolution in this country, and yet you don't want to say anything about something that even conservatives would be offended by, which is the um, discrimination against 50% uh, of a population of a country. That seems odd. Yeah, well, I, to be fair, I'm speculating here. I'm not suggesting <laughs> that is our position, that we're, that's the reason we're staying quiet. I... I just think, to make a more general point, that we have values and interests and we live in an interconnected world. And I think we sometimes underestimate the importance of New Zealand leaders speaking out because people do notice what we say and do. Uh, when we, the way we, the country responded to the Christchurch terror atrocity of well, March a, uh, just the case I was thinking, Yeah, it's just what I was thinking about. She gave the address at Harvard talk, telling the United States that they've got their gun policy yeah. wrong. Well, she's going to say that there. And, you know? and so the Prime Minister's got a very high positive international profile. And I've just thought it would have been good for a small, relatively small state to speak up on an issue that matters to many people. All right. And uh, I, I just think, uh, that's all. I think well, what about the Chinese? Think... You see, because you're talking about totalitarian mm. regimes. Now, uh, yep. Le, Ping has just gone and got himself a third term in China. And as I was just making the point to listeners before I uh, came to you, right. um, the reality is that you can't necessarily say that you've got a communist Chinese regime in China anymore. What you've got is an authoritarian dictatorship, not unlike that enjoyed by Mao Zedong. In fact, he would be, mm, yeah, I would think in the last 120 years, only, t only Mao would have enjoyed the same sort of power that this man has. Um, and we've got one in Russia, as we know, with Putin. Um, you've, yeah. you've given the Iranian uh, example of that as well. Um, you can't deal with totalitarian regimes, can you? But here we are, China's our largest trading partner. Um, we can't afford to upset them, offend them. Do we have to tiptoe gently on the international stage as a consequence of our trading links? I don't think so, no. I think we can strike a balance between doing business with... I mean, China's... I mean, you're quite right to say that Xi Jinping has concentrated enormous power in his hands um, because since he came to power in 2012, he now, as a result of that intervening period, he now has more power than any Chinese leader, as you rightly say, since Mao, Mao Zedong. But, in a sense, China has moved on since we, we, we had that free trade agreement signed with them in 2008. And I think it's very important to let China know that we want a good economic relationship with them, but not at the price of, of political subservience. 
So it's important that we continue to speak up on internet, on human rights and issues like women's rights and other issues that Kiwis care about. I'm just about, so to, have I, a, I think, I'm just about to have a debate with a deluded person about the Ukraine. Um, but one of the things that I'm interested in is whether or not, because Ukraine has strengthened, or I'll ping himself, the Chinese view that they can invade Taiwan. Do you see that happening? Do you see that as a possibility? I, I think a lot is at stake in the Ukraine conflict. Um, if Mr. Putin's forces are defeated, sorry, if Mr. Putin's forces are defeated, it's every possibility that China will have to become precautionary. Uh, if Mr. Putin succeeds in illegally annexing part of Ukraine, that may that may send the message uh, that might can be right, and of course that's bad news for small and middle-sized countries. But um, yeah, I think a lot is hinging on the outcome of the conflict in Ukraine, and uh, make no mistake about it, what's happening in Ukraine has big implications for this country. We need a rules-based system. We trade with more than 100 countries around the world. The last thing we want is a free-for-all where the biggest take what they want. And so, in a sense, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Ukraine could have a big impact. That person wants to talk to you, Robert, so I'll let you go. Thank you very much for giving us your time this morning. Have a very good weekend. Look after yourself. Thank you very much. Cheers. Okay, Bye. all right, thank you. All right, so that's uh, Professor Robert Patman from... He's head of um, international relations, I think. But he's certainly a uh, foreign affairs expert um, from Otago University.